Good evening, everyone. I really am delighted to meet Michael Punky, an author new to us at the Poison Pen. So a salute to you, Michael, and your wonderful Thanks. new Ridgeline. And it's always a thrill to spend time with CJ Box. We were just counting right before we started this, and CJ and I are something like 40 events in. <laughs> over the course of all of his books plus random other events. Um, so anyway, what a treat. But tonight, Patrick Milliken of our store, who is really our uh, Western guy and all, he's going to be the host. So I'm just here to kind of do a little introduction and then I'm going to disappear into a blackout spot and listen. I can so, summon you back for once. Yes, you can summon me back. It's <laughs> been a wonderful thing. It's been like magic. Patrick disappears I'm getting incense so I can light it and wave it when he comes back on. Michael Punky is the author, sorry, is a novelist, professor, policy analyst. I love this. I, I stole it from Wikipedia, as you can tell. <laughs> policy consultant, attorney, and former deputy United States trade representative and U.S. ambassador to the World Trade Organization in Geneva, Switzerland. Are you still the vice president of public policy for Amazon Web Services? I am. That is my day job. Aha. Okay, and he's best known for writing The Revenant, a novel of revenge in 2002, which was adapted into a film called The Revenant in 2015, um, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hardy. And am I right that they were, if they didn't win, they were nominated for Oscars? Uh, it won three Oscars, three okay. different Oscars. Wow, so tough tough act to live up to, but we can hope that Bridgeline will do the same. And maybe CJ will talk about the experience of having his novels, some of them, the Cassie Duell and Hody, uh, Cody Hoyt translated into Big Sky with the Joe Pickett series to come. So Joe is so garlanded with awards, it's hardly worth mentioning them all, but I'll start with the Edgar, also the Anthony, the McCavity, the Gumshoe Berry Awards and the pre Khalid approach I say, just so you know, I can speak French. Um, he's published and this is somewhat dated, over 7 million copies of his books sold in the US, translated into 27 languages. Dark Sky is the most recent Joe Pickett, number 21. And he has a TV series called Big Sky. And I hope a coming Joe Pickett series, which he can tell you about. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to CJ Box, who is going to be talking to Michael. Hi there. It's my. Is it is your last name is, is pronounced Punk? It is actually pronounced Punk. The e is the e is silent. Sorry. Common mistake. That's no, what, don't worry that's about. The, it. Uh, that's <laughs> kind of what it's, I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if you remember this. I do. I remember meeting you the first time at the Montana Book Festival in Missoula. I remember you saying you were from Wyoming and that you had a book called The Revenant coming out. And, and, um, and you had just published and, uh, Open Season, I think. Uh, like the year before or something, right? Yes, yes. And um, when I read the book, which I really liked, I was kind of angry because I'd always wanted to write a book about Hugh Glass. And you <laughs> did it. And you, you did it well. So, um, and the other thing I was wondering, I had a question. You worked at Fort Laramie. Um, uh, yeah. As a... Living in, history. What years... Yeah, what years were that? Was that so? Uh, probably starting in about uh, eighty, uh, and through kind of maybe eighty three, eighty four. So it was okay. when I was in high school and early years of college, summer job. I was just wondering, you know, there's a pretty good possibility that we might have run across each other then. You were in uniform, but right? Yeah, uh, an 1876 cavalry uniform. That's right. Because I do remember going there and thinking, boy, would I hate to wear a hot uniform like that in the summer? <laughs> well, the, that experience, I got to say, came in handy writing, uh, writing Ridgeline because I actually had worn that exact wool uniform that those soldiers wore and had a little bit of insight into that. Yeah, that's well, you know, I'm jumping ahead too much. Um, we should probably... Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what this book is about and what it's based on? And I, I probably, Patrick, you jump in, but I mean, I probably have 50 notes that I took while reading it. Um, so I could go on and on, but uh, it'd probably be better to get an overview first. Sure. Well, let me, let me just start very quickly by saying thanks to Poison Pen and, uh, and to Barbara and uh, CJ for you uh, hosting this. I, I appreciate the chance to come talk about the book. 
Uh, it just came out this week. It's called Ridgeline, and I'm super excited about it. It's a it's about an incident in Wyoming history that, uh, frankly, a lot of people in Wyoming don't even really know very much about. CJ, I know you've spent so much time on both sides of the Bighorns that you know very well about the the Fetterman fight and Red Cloud's war that Fetterman's fight is a part of. But uh, very succinctly, in 1866, on December 21st, on a very cold day, a group of uh, Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho decoys led by Crazy Horse led a large group of soldiers over a ridge line in Wyoming. And uh, there was a battle that ensued that was the worst defeat of the US Army up until that point. And in some ways has some parallels to the, to the Custer fight that took place 10 years later and 100 miles further north. But uh, in part because of the Custer battle is, is much less well known. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, that story is something that I, I really had to do a lot of um, research while reading your book, because I think um, when I was taught history in third grade in Wyoming, Wyoming history, it was called the Fetterman Massacre. Yeah. And, um, you know, that there, it's not that, that you, you have, re well, you have kind of rewritten history, but with better information. I think than what we got at the time. When I got that history, the the hero of the entire thing was not Red Cloud or Crazy Horse, but what was his name? Portuguese Phillips. Portuguese Phillips. He made the ride afterwards. Right. Yeah. That, we knew about yeah. him. We knew yeah. about him, but you know, but but not the the, um, the details of the the fight. And then a couple of years ago, I read a book. Um, you you referenced it. Um, the Heart of Everything That Is, that yeah, about Red Cloud. A nonfiction book and about it. Terrific book. Yep, book. it was. Um, but of course, in that kind of, you know, okay, here, Michael, I wanted to ask you a question because I, I, I um, how, what is your methodology for taking real people, characters, um, some which had very little actual record or journals or whatever, um, and uh, telling a, a you know doing a historical novel from their point of view. Sure. Well, I guess the starting point for me is I take the the history piece of historical fiction really seriously. I, I've always loved history, as as you said. Uh, even as a teenager, I was working at Fort Laramie National Historic Site and talking to tourists about about Western history. And so I love the history and I take it seriously and I want to get it right. Even in a, even in a fiction book, I don't want readers to, to have some misimpression of a big event in history or of a, a care of, of a historical character, a misimpression of the type of person that they were. So I do a lot of research and want to make sure that I get all the kind of mileposts correct. But what I really love about fiction as a, as a vehicle is it gives you an opportunity as a writer to kind of fill in all the blanks. And of course, there's so many blanks in history, uh, even on events that we know a lot about and where there's a big record. And then when you get to something like the, the Fetterman fight, where uh, you know, they ride over the, the ridge line and uh, everybody in the, uh, you know, it ends badly for uh, a lot of people on the US side. There are Native American uh, oral histories of the battle that are one source, but it's a very confused uh, history and there's just a lot of space there to fill in the blanks. Well, I, I thought you did it extremely well. I was fascinated with your portrayal of Crazy Horse because I've read a lot about Crazy Horse and I admire him, but um, he didn't even let, he, he never got a picture taken of himself. Um, how can you get into somebody's head like that who is almost it was a, a mythic even when he was alive? He's such a great character. And, you know, like you, he's been a hero of mine since since I was a boy. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I felt a huge sense of responsibility to, to portray his character in a in an accurate and, and respectful way. And 
you know, what I did as far as the method goes for, for his character is, again, I started off with reading everything that I could read that, uh, and just kind of, you know, learning as much about, about the history. There's a couple of really great Native American accounts of Crazy Horse, and including one that's written by a Lakota author named Joseph Marshall uh, that mm -hmm. relies on a lot of the oral history. After I had a draft of the book, I shared it. I, uh, I have a, a colleague of mine that I work with in, in the US government who is a, who's a Native American uh, leader today. And he read an initial draft and recommended uh, several other people for me to share it with. So I ended up having about nine different uh, Native American readers, got a lot of feedback from their uh, reading of the book incorporated a lot of that feedback into how I portrayed not only the story of Crazy Horse, but also the broader kind of native story. And so, you know, that was my, my method. But one thing I felt really strongly about is, you know, the story that we were telling about, about the history of the West when I was working at Fort Laramie National Historic Site in 1983, left out a lot of what's in Ridgeline. And I felt very strongly that that broader perspective needed to be portrayed. You know what's you know what's interesting. Just to, to submit something here, um, you know a lot of those early books about you know I'm thinking of you know of course Murray Sandoz's book on Crazy Horse, the Strange Man of the Oglalas, and uh, you know those early ones like Stanley Vestal's Sitting Bull. Um, uh, it's interesting how they you know a lot of historians. You know, they came out in the 30s and the 40s when there were still some living people that you know participated in some of these events uh, on both sides. Um, but a lot of those early ones seem to really play into the myth. Um, and so there's been, I've noticed in the last maybe 20 or 30 years, it's funny because Chuck and I, every time he comes out here, we trade notes about, okay, so what Western nonfiction book have you read recently? But there's been this uh, this big reassessment. It seems like you know, of look taking an objective look at, at some of these characters, um, you know, uh, new biographies of some of these main figures. It's very really interesting, and I really admired how even-handed you were in uh, presenting the story. You know, you you didn't really perceivably take a side, which I thought was great. You know, you just sort of showed us both. Uh, well, thanks for that. I mean, one of the things, uh, and CJ, you were asking about my method earlier, and I guess uh, part of my method is trying to find a great historical story that just is interesting to me as history. And one of the things I loved about this story so much is uh, I think all of the bones of the story are so compelling, including the the characters you know, on, and there's lots of characters in this book. I mean, not only Crazy Horse and Red Cloud uh, on the Lakota side, but I was amazed that Jim Bridger, who was a boy in The Revenant, uh, is shows up as a 66-year-old scout for the U.S. Army in the real-life events of 1866. That was total catnip for me as a, as a writer. Uh, the women who are part of this story. One of the things I learned working at Fort Laramie and the, the US government, government was starting to do a little bit better job by then of talking about the role of women in the West. And of course, many of the officers took their wives with them to these very remote frontier outposts. Uh, the army also took laundresses along to, to do the laundry for the men. So there's this whole culture of women on these remote outposts at this time. Those were great characters to work with. So there just was a lot to work with uh, drawn from real life. I agree. And, uh, you know, I, I made a list. I mean, it's almost a who's who of West of true Western characters all in the same place. And it's that's what astonished me. I knew about Jim Bridger being there. I didn't know that uh, James, Beckworth James Beckworth was also there. It, yeah. which, he was, it was his, one of my kind of, I, I, I've read books about him. I want to know more about him, you know, and you did it. Um, Nelson Story, uh, who brought, you know, I know Story Wyoming. I know uh, Nelson Story is basically, I think what Larry McMurtry um, had in mind when he wrote Gus McCall 
uh, yep. for Lonesome Dove. Exactly. Because they, they took took the Texas Longhorns up through Wyoming to Montana. Um, and you've got some, you know, I love this stuff, you know, Red Cloud, Carrington. Um, Nelson's story, I it amazed me when I read the end notes that said in real life, he was a big shot in Montana. And then eventually he became a, a real estate salesman in LA. In LA. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, you couldn't bunch, write that in. <laughs> I know. There's actually a bunch of those early Montana millionaires who became early Montana multimillionaires by investing in, in LA real estate. So that was, that was more common than it, it kind of surprised me too, but no, what you're saying that the, the real life characters that are swirling around in this thing were just amazing to me. And, and to take the example of James Beckworth and for, for listeners who may not know, uh, Jim Bridger, King of the mountain man was a boy uh, that was one of the characters in the revenant who abandoned uh, Hugh Glass but he goes on to have this amazing career uh, scouting, uh, you know, many discovering many of the places as, as the first white explorer of the Great Salt Lake, for example. Uh, he really is a, a hero of, of that era. And then to not only have him there, there, but this guy, James Beckworth, who is a mixed race uh, mountain man. He's the son of a, a white father and his mother was a slave. His father frees him as a, as a teenager, and James Beckworth goes out and is in the same Rocky Mountain Fur Company troop that, that Jim Bridger was in. So then the two of these guys show up scouting for the U.S. Army in 1866, and one of the things that I found out that they did in real life is they're dispatched by Colonel Carrington, the commanding officer, to go off the two of them on this months-long uh, scouting expedition to figure out where the tribes are and thinking about what the two of them must have been talking about as 60 mm -hmm. something year olds at the end of these incredible careers riding through dangerous country was just the perfect thing to me to to imagine as a as a fictional writer so i played well, with that I, a lot yeah, I, I, I would, too. I thought that was extremely well done and fascinating. Whether or not you knew about them ahead of time or not, I think anybody who doesn't um, will get enough about them that they'll want more um, about. Both well, and the Nelson um, story, the Nelson story story that you mentioned, again, I couldn't believe that this popped up, that literally in the middle of this war that is being fought across the fall of 1866 in the Powder River Valley, this guy, Nelson Story, for the first time ever, drives a, a herd of a thousand Texas Longhorns from Texas to Montana, as you say, the real life basis uh, for Lonesome Dove. And he just, you know, through moxie and by being a, a badass, uh, succeeds in driving a thousand cattle to Virginia City, Montana, and sells half of them to become uh, rich and uses the other half to seed the first herd in Paradise Valley, north of Livingston. So just fascinating real life characters. It's amazing. Oh, I agree. What happens in that very, very short period of time from 1866 to 1890, the ghost dance era, you know? I mean, the, the end of a com whole way of life, you know, with the extinction of the buffalo herds. And it's- Yeah, it's and really incredible. accelerates after the Civil War, it, it the, you know, events that have been moving somewhat slowly just accelerate so dramatically. And just the wave of, of immigration that, that comes from the Eastern United States and the collision of, of that, uh, you know, expansion of, of, of uh, white Americans coming West with the cultures that were already there is, you know, one of the great, one of the great American tragedies. Yeah. And the, and the, the American Indians in the book, you know, they, they, they see that the soldiers increasingly are bringing their women and children along and they, they see the writing on the wall and this is, it, it's getting desperate and that, that really informs this, this book. Well, it's very different from the fur trade era that I wrote about in, in The Revenant, you know, the 1820s, 1830s, where in the historical scheme, that era, it really was a trickle of, of, of whites coming west and uh, almost exclusively uh, men. 
and they they intermarried with the tribes and integrated with tribal culture. There was conflict for sure, but it was a it was on a whole different level of of magnitude. Uh, and as you point out, you know the army in 1866 is bringing women and children, and that could only mean that they intended to establish a new civilization in place of the one that was already there. I have a historical question to ask you because there's no doubt that there's some parallels between the Fetterman fight and Custer's last stand. Yeah. Um, are these the only two times in the history of the Plains that um, multiple once warring tribes got together um, to attack soldiers? That's, a, that's an interesting question. And without knowing for sure, I guess my answer would be, I, I'd be surprised. Um, but certainly on this scale, uh, you know, what's so unique about what Red Cloud did from my standpoint, one of the reasons it's amazing that he's not more famous is- I agree. He, he was both a, a diplomatic genius and a military genius. And over the course of the fall, what he's doing, what Red Cloud is doing, as you point out, is he's pulling these uh, tribes together, uh, including even uh, apparently sending out uh, feelers to the crow to see if the crow were interested in being part of this coalition. And of course, that's uh, remarkable because the Lakota and the crow had been such serious historic enemies. So, uh, you know, on this scale, I don't think that had, had, had been done. Um, and then, you know, from a military standpoint, what Red Cloud does is he, and to me, that's the, the, one of the most interesting differences between uh, the Fetterman fight and the Custer fight. The Custer fight, as brilliant as the, uh, as the tribes fought in that, uh, in that battle, they were very much reacting to being attacked. And mm -hmm. in the Fetterman fight, they set a trap that they spent months uh, pulling together and it's an intricate and brilliant trap. And then they execute it with incredible skill. And so the two battles, even though both of them have that massive scale are, are very different in that way. Yeah, I, it was, it, it, and it's, it's odd to think that the only two times that all of multiple tribes got together, band together, they, they won, um, at least for a while, and then broke up again. You know, you know um, what, one of the things that's interesting about that to me, just from a logistic standpoint, if you think about the challenge that the Native Americans faced, is you th think about how hard it would be to feed a village of seven, five or 7,000 people that was supporting a, you know, 2,000 warriors. I mean, you know, I grew up in Torrington, Wyoming, that's 7,000 people. Uh, you know, if you think about trying to, to find game uh, to feed 7,000 mm -hmm. people on an ongoing basis, there was a reason that they couldn't hang together in groups that big. It, they just couldn't, Good they point. couldn't feed themselves that way. And so, of course, the first thing they do, both after the Fetterman fight and after the Custer fight, is they break into smaller bands because both because they were worried about being pursued, but also because just that was the only way for them to, to feed themselves. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's interesting. I think some of the, um, you stage the battle so extremely well. Um, I'm a, you know, I'm very discerning reader when it comes to that kind of thing. And I felt like um, you did it in a visual way that made me feel like I was there on both sides. Um, but I think um, some of the most striking prose in the book, and I'm not giving anything away because we're talking about a battle, is when um, the U.S. Army is sucked in to the trap and they start to see, I mean, because I, I kept thinking about that. How, how did thousands of Indians conceal themselves in kind of an open area and their horses um, but the, yeah but the writing <laughs> as all of a sudden the the grass the scrub the snow comes alive as they all get up was brilliant oh you thanks know, my hat's off to you. well thanks for that i uh i had one of the 
most fun things that I did in the research for this was the time I spent on the battlefield and, you know, made several trips there. And, and it's an, it's, as, as you know, it's an enormous uh, battlefield and it's right at, in this beautiful valley at the, at the base of the, of the Bighorns, what the Lakota called the shining mountains. And it's a, it's a beautiful spot, but relatively speaking, it's pretty open. I mean, mm -hmm. I always, I always hate when people use the, the, the uh, term featureless for planes because people who live in the planes know that they're not so featureless. There's all sorts of coolies and draws and crick beds and everything else. But when you walk this battlefield, you can't imagine that they could hide 2000 warriors and 2000 horses in this relatively open area. And they did it, which is again, part of the, the technical brilliance of the, of the battle plan that they executed on. Yep. I had another question. Oh, sorry, Patrick. I've got, the, um, you know, you changed my impression of Fetterman himself Good. <laughs> uh, from what I had, I had kind of grown up with and just kind of accepted as common knowledge. Um, and can you talk about that sure. a little bit? How did his, how did his reputation go from being a, you know, kind of a hard charging, arrogant drunk to being, as you portrayed him, as um, you know, kind of doubting his commanding officer, but not being, but basically getting swept along and doing his best. Well, it's it's a kind of a fascinating story about how the history of the Fetterman fight came to be, and a lot of the way that it it, it came to be is uh, the commanding officer at. Uh, at the fort at the time is named Carrington, Colonel Carrington. And he is back at the fort while the others are riding out to, into this battle. And after it goes badly, Carrington's main goal in life, uh, and you know he's not the only person who, uh, who did something like this, but he spent the rest of his career basically trying to, to not get blamed for the Fetterman fight. And the way that Carrington did that is he needed a scapegoat. And the scapegoat that he picked was Fetterman. And Fetterman was the senior officer in charge of the, of the troops that went out to fight that day. So he was technically responsible for what happened on the field. But uh, there, I think there's, there's recent scholarship that has been done on this battle, um, including by a guy named John Monnet and by a woman named Shannon Smith, who have both both written books, uh, nonfiction books about the battle, where they uh, believe that the cavalry officer uh, Grummond had a lot uh, should have been blamed more than he was. And the the best historical evidence for me for that proposition is if you look at the respective careers of Fetterman on the one hand and Grummond on the other hand, uh, everything in Fetterman's past and both Fetterman and Grummond had been, uh, had been, had a lot of combat experience in the civil war. Fetterman had a reputation uh, for not only for bravery, but also for very much being somebody who uh, followed the company line. Grummond by contrast, uh, was court-martialed in the Civil War for uh, drunkenness, uh, for disobeying orders, for uh, shooting an unarmed uh, civilian, and for pistol whipping one of his own non-commissioned officers. So to me, when you kind of weighed the evidence just of their past character, Grumman seemed more likely to have been the villain. And then you combine that with the fact that Grumman was in charge of the cavalry. And if you're trying to figure out in the heat of battle, who goes chasing after the decoys, it's a lot, easy, a lot easier to chase decoys on horseback than it is with infantry. And Fetterman was leading the men who were kind of marching along, uh, you know, running, trying to run up the hill. So that's my, those are my reasons for kind of landing where I did and kind of riding it the way that I did. I think, well, I found it fascinating and it, very interesting the, the way you did that. Um, did, 
if I remember, I made some notes and I should have looked back a little closer. Did Frances Grumman, did she become the second wife of Carrington? She did. It's a little, uh, a little, a little scandalous. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's a, uh, for people who don't know the story, there is a, a officer's wife named Frances Grummond, who is married to Lieutenant Grummond uh, in this story. And uh, later on, uh, and I won't re reveal all the circumstances, I, I talk about it in an epilogue, uh, she ends up being married uh, to Carrington, the commanding officer, and uh, actually writes an autobiography that many people believe was partially written by Carrington to propagate the story that he was not to blame for this battle and that Fetterman was to blame. So Francis kind of becomes part of this uh, uh, making of a, what I think was a, a false history of, of this battle. But interestingly, there's other parts of her autobiography that are quite fascinating and really, you know, just about her life on the, on the plains and as an army wife and reading her autobiography gave me the idea of using journal entries written by her as part of, of the way of telling her story, which is the, the mechanism that I use in the book to kind of introduce her, her character to readers. So that's it. And I don't mean to ask, I, I mean, hopefully people who are watching this aren't, did she, did she in fact keep a, uh, an official journal and an unofficial journal, or is that something that you came up with to tell the story? So I came up with that to tell the story. I don't know okay. of her actually keeping a journal. Uh, many of the officers' wives did, so I, it would not be surprising if she did. Um, I don't. I don't know. But the journals that I made up, and as you say, the device that I used to kind of reflect the the difficult role that women in the 19th century had, even of you know, talking about their own lives, I used the device of her keeping two journals, one of which was an official journal that's a little bit more of the, the uh, candy-coated version of her life, but then also keeping a secret journal where she is much more revealing in terms of what's really going on in her life. And so that was the, that was the mechanism. The journals are, are fictionalized, but as I said, it was easier to do that because she did write this autobiography where I really did get a feel, I thought, for, for her voice. She's a great character. She is. And that's a very clever writerly technique, I thought, if you made up the two journals. So that's well done. Well, thanks. Um, I appreciate that. The other, another thing I really liked about the book um, you know, in addition to all the detail and the, the, you know, the daily and the army life and um, you know, what they ate. Um, oh, one thing, they drank a lot, didn't they? Um, they did. I mean, yes, they every, did. every time I read a true historical um, <laughs> account of that era, everybody's drunk constantly. Yeah. Right. And you wonder about the logistics of um, that. But I have an explanation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this comes from my time as a working at Fort Laramie when twice a day, uh, twice a week, my job was to bake army bread in the Fort Laramie Army Bakery. And one of the things that we talked to tourists about and that we interpreted is we had a, a barrel of yeast in, uh, in the bakery that had a, a padlock on it. And the reason it had a padlock on it is because if they didn't keep it locked up, the soldiers would steal the yeast to make, to make liquor, to make uh, moonshine. And so that kind of gave me the idea of, and I, I'm guessing that that was not wholly successful in terms of the, uh, the army's effort to prevent soldiers from making, making booze. And so that's one of the things that I portrayed in, in, at Fort, at, uh, in the fort that, in, in Ridgeline. Well, it's very well done. And um, you, know, you know, the portrayal of the, uh, not the officers, but the enlisted men, um, as being, uh, you know, multi-ethnics, um, some uh, barely speaking English. Uh, they did, you know, who, most of them, I'm guessing, did not fight in the Civil War, um, you know, and then putting them in this fort in this very isolated, remote 
Mount Wyoming mountains um, really set the scene well? Well, I, I've always thought when I've gone to places like the the uh, Little Bighorn Battlefield or when I've walked the battlefield at, uh, for the Fetterman fight, you know, as you say, a lot of those soldiers in that era were very recent uh, immigrants who signed up to the U.S. Army, uh, the Germans because they wanted to learn how to, to speak English and make a living while they did it, and the Irish because they were, were hungry for work. But when you think about you know, these guys standing out there in the, you know, last moments of some of these battles in this, what to them must look like a godforsaken place, recognizing that they're about to die in a very horrible way and thinking about them only arriving on the continent in many cases a, f a few months before. And they must have really been thinking, you know, I made a bad career choice here. <laughs> and signing up for the U.S. Army. Can you talk a little bit I about? Agree. Can you talk a little bit about about Fort Kearney itself? Is it? Uh, there's a lot of really interesting descriptions of of the fort itself. I'll and, be right. Back. Yeah, and um, is it still in a fairly remote part of the state? I understand. It is uh, still uh, fairly remote. It's it's kind of uh, between uh, Buffalo and Sheridan but it's in a, a valley where there now are uh, scattered ranches, but it is, it is not developed extensively. The, 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 uh, either the Cheyenne or the Lakota, it's not clear. One of the tribes burned the fort to the ground at, at one point further on in the history the, from where I write. So the, the fort itself, you can, the, the perimeter has been, uh, has been recreated and it's enormous. It, it was an, it, it, it contained 13 acres and there's a great visitor center there uh, run by the Wyoming State Historical Society um, or the, uh, it's a Wyoming State Park, but it's a great place to visit. And one of the things I love about it so much in contrast to the Little Bighorn Battlefield is it, it and especially when you get over to the battlefield, which is about three miles away from the site of the fort, it's it's pretty it's pretty well preserved and you can really it's not hard to imagine what it looked like. Have they done an archaeological dig on that battlefield? I don't know about a dig. They've done research over the years, and uh, I, I think they're in the '60s. There was a big uh, 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 university-sponsored group that went out and you know with metal detectors and all of that. Um, I, I don't know the, the details of that, so I shouldn't get too far over my skis on that, but it, there's, there's been quite a bit of research. Yes. And gold, gold, of course, plays a big part in this whole westward expansion at this time, right? I mean, that's... Well, gold, it turns out, the more you study about Western American history, the more gold is at the core of so much of it, certainly when it comes to conflict with, with the tribes because what the history of the 19th century is, is the US government sort of trying to push the Indians away from the, the land they want in that particular year. And in 1851, all they wanted was a narrow strip of land going across the middle of the continent so that people could get to, to California and Oregon. But by the 1860s, the placer gold has run out in California. And so the gold miners start coming back and looking at places like, you know, Nevada, Colorado, and in 1862, Montana. And so there's a gold rush during the Civil War and even more so afterwards. And at that point, this 1851 treaty that had been negotiated became politically unpopular and inconvenient. And so the U.S. government pushes it aside, and that really sets up the, the foundation for this fight in 1866. Let's talk a little bit more about, and Chuck, um, jump in, about Crazy Horse himself. You know, this uh, very romantic, uh, you know, a lot of mythology shrouded around him. Um, how did you, or what surprised you during the research? What... Um, going into the book, what you knew about him before. Yeah. How, how did your view of Crazy Horse change during this? Um, I guess what I love about Crazy Horse at this era, and as I said, he's he's been a hero of mine since I was a boy, 
Curly. But I, but I really knew more about the kind of uh, end of the of the Indian Wars era, the kind of Little Bighorn era, where he's ten years older at that point, and he's a great chief, and almost mythical as as a leader, deservedly. What I love about 1866 versus 1876 is he's someplace between you know 22 and 26 years old. He's young. And so I thought it was it it was fun to think about him much more as a as a human being as opposed to a mythical warrior. Right. And you know, somebody who was already respected as a hunter and as a warrior and who was given this honor of being not only being one of the decoys that that uh, lures the army out of the fort, but but is the leader of the decoys. So he's a great warrior already, but I could imagine him being making mistakes and uh, uh, you know having moments of of impetuousness and uh, not having yet evolved in to the kind of fully fledged. Uh, more philosophical kind of crazy horse that I think he, he, you know, very much becomes later on. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm surmising some there, but I do think it's consistent with, uh, with some of the accounts, the historical accounts of his life and, and his evolution into the, into the person that he becomes later on that, I, I don't know if it surprised me, but it, it was a fun part of his life to portray. And he had that according to reports, that brownish, curly hair, right? I mean, wasn't his nickname Curly? Uh, supposedly, uh, his, his, uh, his boyhood name was, was Curly or, or Light Hair for having a slightly different, uh, not as dark of hair as other members of the tribe. Right. Then there are other characters like Gaul, you know, and uh, other figures that kind of arise during this that don't get a lot of the, the attention. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing that I love about Crazy Horse that I thought was interesting in terms of things that surprised me is um, he he's he has two uh, older men in his life who are very influential in in who he becomes as a as a person. One is his father, uh, who whose original name was Crazy Horse, but his father horse gives the name Crazy Horse to his son and takes the name Worm as a as a sign of humility. Crazy Horse's uh, father is a is a spiritual leader. His uncle, uh, High Backbone, who I also portray in the book, was uh, had much more responsibility apparently for for uh, teaching Crazy Horse about hunting and being a warrior. So he has these two very strong uh, 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 father like figures in his life. One of whom is a spiritual leader one of whom is known as a great warrior. And those two things really do seem to, to come together to create this, this persona that is, is really amazing. I had a, I was impressed with the, uh, with your research and the emphasis on um, technology of the soldiers um, that, uh, you know, the, the crazy horse, acknowledges you know that and um you know that the first repeating arms yeah. how they sh they show up in the battle um but the fact that they still the soldiers still lost because of the trickery um and and really up against very primitive weapons and tact not not tactics but weapons certainly yeah so, uh, that's I, another big difference between 1866 and 1876 uh by 1876 at little bighorn the, the uh many of the lakota and cheyenne were better armed uh than than the army with you know state-of-the-art uh winchester henry repeating rifles in 1866 most of the of the lakota cheyenne arapaho were fighting with bows and arrows a few had uh, uh, rifles, but they would have been single shot uh, muzzle loading rifles. Ironically, uh, despite the fact that during the Civil War, there had been these incredible advances in, in weapons technology, which always happens in war, the US Army did not see fit to give most of their soldiers very good weapons. And so 
uh, of the of the 81 men who went out to fight on December 21st, 1866, uh, two of them who were civilians had 16 shot Henry repeating rifles, which were remarkable weapons. Uh, 20 of the cavalrymen uh, had had Spencer uh, repeating rifles that uh, didn't hold as many uh, bullets, but were also quite effective weapons, but they didn't know how to use them. They're, the army gave them very little ammunition, so they hadn't practiced with them. Um, and most of the soldiers had muzzle-loading Springfields that were, you know, uh, very difficult to, to load rapidly and really gave the, 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 the Lakota and the Cheyenne an advantage with their ability to fire very rapidly with bow and arrow. Yeah, I, I thought that was, I, I love that um, and found that fascinating. One of the other things that I'm uh, interested in, again, after uh, not to talk about Fort Laramie too much, although I hope everybody goes and visits for, both Fort Laramie and uh, and the Fetterman uh, battlefield site. But uh, one of the fun things I got to do working at Fort Laramie is we fired a cannon twice a day, an 1841 mountain howitzer. And so I had the experience for three summers of firing a vintage cannon twice a day. And that stuck in my head again as something that I wanted to write about. The artillery technology of the day is remarkably advanced in terms of the ability that they had, even with muzzle loading cannons, to fire a round downfield that could explode at a, at a precise place uh, downrange. It, they, they could fire that with, with great accuracy. And it's one of the reasons that, that tribes very rarely attacked forts. You know, the John Wayne movie of the of the Indians riding in and attacking the fort didn't happen very often. And it didn't happen here because Red Cloud is way too smart. He knew that the last place that he wanted to fight the U.S. Army was in this fortified place that they had built where they had all the advantages. So he knew that the challenge was to somehow suck them out of the fort, get them away from cannon range. And that's that was his his plan of, of how to 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 win. But that was a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. Interesting thinking about these, the military battle strategies too, in such a relatively short time, how, how they changed, you know, with the old school, you know, let's all stand in a line and point rifles at each other, you know, in some of the early civil war battles to the, you know, the, the guerrilla techniques of the, you know, the later war in the Kansas and all that yeah. era. Um, and can you talk a little bit about that? Well, what the, what the U.S. Army ultimately discovers is that the time when the tribes are weakest is during winter. And what they, what they begin, what, what they do when they, after the Battle of, of the Little Bighorn, when they get very serious about, about winning the war against the, the Plains Indians, is they start to, to harry them in the winter. And then what we were talking about earlier, the difficulty that the, these tribes had who had broken into smaller groups uh, already, and then were forced to, to move with uh, families in tow, it just was not gonna be tenable for very long. One of the interesting things that I came across just as a number, and I don't usually like numbers very much, but uh, I read that the, the, the population of the United States in uh, 1866 was around 30 million people. And in, during the Civil War, the Union Army was 2 million standing men. The, the Confederate Army was a million men. So if the US wanted to, it could field an army of 3 million people. There, by this one account, there were about 75,000 uh, Native Americans in all of the Plains tribes combined, about 16,000 uh, Lakota, of which about 4,000 were uh, men of fighting age. So the, the numbers just, there was no way once the US decided that, you know, we're going to pursue this to the end, that, that, that the that the tribes could could stand up against that and ultimately they couldn't it's 
it's inconceivable to think about, you know, as I was at the beginning of the program, the extermination of the buffalo, to think about the sheer number of buffalo up until that point that were on the plains. I mean, it's in the millions and millions, correct? Uh, probably about 30 million uh, yeah. uh, at the, at the, you know, before the, it started to be whittled down. And then by and the it had already, yeah. And the, 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 what, when the, when the, uh, when the Oregon Trail goes through, the great herd of buff, buffalo divi divides between north and south. And the southern herd down in Kansas had already started to be uh, wiped out because once the railroad uh, got to Kansas, of course, that's when the buffalo hunting became commercially viable. The northern herd uh, had not yet been wiped out, but had, was already under stress. I pop back in Michael, and mentioned the railroads. Oh. Sorry, CJ. I mean, I can't help it because um, I was inoculated with the whole railroad history in 1958 when I got to Stanford because, you know, there we are. Um, but I, I think that the death knell of the Plains Indians was wrung in great part by the railroad once they established that way to bring uh, families and children and supplies and so forth. There was never any way that um, that the Indians could that the native tribes could hold any advantage. It was always going to be, you know. It, and it's after and the Civil fact, War. Uh, I, I just looked it up, but the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific really, you know, it was the 1860s, and that's a big difference between your period and the Revenant and um, true. and Ridgeline is that once the railroads were there and it was, you had a supply line and a people carrying thing that could go all the way across the country. There we were. I wanted to add too, as a reader, I had two things that I really appreciated about this book because I'm not as well-versed in it as Patrick. One is I love, I hope I'm remembering this right because I haven't seen my arc for some time. I love the map. Please tell me there is a map. Okay. Right, because yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a really visual person, and I think it, I think the addition of the map makes it very possible to um, to work out what you're talking about. I kept exactly, I kept referring back to it and back to it, trying to work out the, um, you know, the the logistics and the geography. And the other thing I really loved was the way you did write the epilogue, so we knew what happened to a lot of the people, it's it's too bad to just like dump them at the end of the battle or whatever it is. And you think, well, you know, what happened? And what were their lives? So I really appreciated the fact that you um, took Good. the time to, to do that for us. So I'm saying this for somebody who might be listening to this, who like me is not as well versed in this history that, um, that, that Mr. Punk, now that I know how to pronounce your name, sorry, um, that Mr. Punk makes it easy for you to um, both work out the landscape of the book, but also um, the end of the story for a lot of the characters that was in it. CJ, did you like that? Oh, yeah, I had one other thing. Um, just thinking, because you know, reading, you know, being kind of a student of this history, especially in Wyoming. And by the way, for all the viewers out there, almost all of the significant Western stories, battles, everything took place in Wyoming. It's just that since hey, they were leader, writer, writers have taken them and moved them into other states <laughs> or the, for their own benefit. I'm going to make um, an argument for Montana to contend on that front, but we can have a, we can have well, that debate later. There's a lot in Wyoming yeah, for sure. <laughs> Montana's a close second, I would say. Um, <laughs> no, uh, was there any other major battle between the, the Army and American Indians that took place in the winter? Um, the fact that the attack or the, the war, I mean, I know what December is like in the Bighorns and in Wyoming. Oh. The fact that um, it occurred on, nearly on Christmas even though I'd, I think I'd read it before, it somehow it zinged by me looking at date, but thinking of the conditions um, and what it's like in the mountains in December, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say definitively no. And, and in part because at the, of course, by the after, you know, by the end of the Plains Wars, they were going out in the winter very explicitly, but, you know, for a long time, uh, the, the, the U S army was, was not, pursuing the tribes as aggressively in winter, in part because it was tough on them too. And mm -hmm. you know, they were not, their soldiers weren't that great at maintaining a campaign and 
carrying with them the supplies that they needed, both, you know, the, you know, including feed for their horses. So it was not easy to do. One of the, one of the links between the Civil War and the end of the Indian Wars is, is really the doctrine of total warfare that William Tecumseh Sherman developed in driving the Civil War to its end. And the notion that he would make the civilian population pay a price for the war is, is what you know the March to the Sea is, was all about with William Sherman. He is the driving the strategy of the US Army at the end of the Indian Wars. And he brings that total warfare doctrine to the Indian Wars after the Battle of Little Bighorn. And that meant destroying their food source, i.e. the buffalo. It meant attacking them in, in winter to, to force them out of these sheltered valleys where they otherwise would, would try and survive the winter. And so it's that total warfare doctrine of, of winter battles that ultimately you know, lead the US to prevail. And then culminating in that horrible, uh, it wasn't a battle, but wounded knee. Yeah, and that uh, took place in, in winter as well. But as you say, it was, uh, can't really even be called a, a battle. No. Andrew, do you have Facebook questions that you wanted to no. present? I'm no, going to um, disappear again, but I think you ought to give the audience a fair shot at this. Well, I've been, I've been watching and there aren't enough real questions. So, okay. Uh, great, great discussion. Um, uh, met Mr. Box at Old Faithful Inn a few years ago. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. I haven't read any of Michael's books, but I sure am looking forward to doing so now. Uh, great discussion. Oh, here's a good one. Um, you know, comparing comparing uh, this battle with Little Bighorn, uh, was it worse in terms of casualties versus Little Bighorn? No, right? No. Uh, Little Bighorn, uh, over 200 men were with with Custer, and uh, there were there were 81 men killed in in this, this battle that I write about. This battle was the worst defeat of the US Army until Little Bighorn and was, was very famous in that decade long period for that reason, but then is kind of subsumed uh, uh, both politically and in history by, by Custer. So if there's no more history, I mean, no more questions to talk about. CJ, why don't you bring us up to date on Dark Sky and uh, sorry, Joe Pickett and Big Sky. And for people who don't know um, The Revenant, Mike, Michael, maybe you could say a few words about that and how you both feel about your works getting translated into film, which is a different experience. Sure, CJ, you go first. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, yeah, Big Sky um, was, uh, was aired on ABC this year. That's based on the Cassie Duell, um, Cody Hoyt books that take place primarily in Montana and um, uh, North Dakota, because uh, I'd never want to have, you know, a serial killer that vicious in Wyoming, so I put him <laughs> in Montana, Michael. Thanks. Um, it, it, That's generous of and you. And it's, uh, it's, been, it's been very successful, um, got renewed for another season. It was ABC's um, highest rated um, new show. I don't, you know, People ask me how involved I have been in with that, and um, you know, my my answer is I provided the source material and I cashed the checks. That's how involved I have been. Um, I, I did have early conversations with David E. Kelly, who who uh, the showrunner for the first six episodes, about kind of the overall art kind of thing, and he did in kind of incorporated those notes, but. Um, now it's to the point where I watch every week to see what's going to happen as well. And uh, um, next, they've, they've optioned all of those books. They burned through two of them the first season. So there's only two more. So after that, who knows? Um, the uh, cool news is that um, Joe Pickett, it's called Joe Pickett, is shooting right now in Calgary. Congratulations. Um, I can't believe hey. that that's taken him this long. And so, uh, so much well, fun. Yeah. So much material there. Oh, me too. But you know, uh, what what I'm really happy about is that um, the producers, the showrunners, seem to really get it. They're going book by book. Um, they really, uh, you know, have been 
in touch with me about certain aspects. Um, they want me to come visit the set, which I can't do because it's in Canada and right now. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very excited about that as well. Um, so that's what I, that's, that's the update. It'll be on, um, it'll be a Spectrum original, the, the, the cable company, but also be available, you know, on Hulu, uh, Paramount Plus. You can watch TV shows so many ways these days. So it's not, yeah. you're not, if somebody doesn't have that particular cable company, they'll be able to find it. Are you happy with the casting choices so far? I am. I'm thrilled. Um, the guy that they hired for, uh, for uh, Joe Pickett is, is an actor from New Zealand named Michael Dorman, who I was a huge fan of. Um, not many people know who he was, but I watched a, a show on uh, Amazon, I believe it was, called Patriot with him as the lead. And I love this guy. So I think he's kind of an inspired choice. And I think they've done inspired casting throughout. So how about this? Speak I'm Wyoming. To see it. What's that? Does he speak Wyoming? I'll find out. We'll see. Um, <laughs> he spoke pretty good Milwaukee and Patriot, so I assume he can figure out Wyoming. How about Nate Romanowski? He is, he, that's kind of outside the box. He, they hired a um, very big kind of charismatic black actor um, and for that role. And I've been in touch with him. And he's into it so much that I'm excited. He's been firing a 454 Casual. He's taken falconry lessons. Um, you know, I, I think it, I think it's kind of an inspired choice as well. Oh, that's cool. His name, his name is Mustafa Speaks. Is the new Nate Romanowski? Right on. That sounds great. Talking about the uh, uh, cashing a check, uh, I always. <laughs> When people ask about the, the the difference between books and movies, I always say that the book contract is about six pages long, and most of it says they can't change a word without your permission. The the TV or film contract is about sixty pages long, and it says they can change anything they want without your permission. So mm -hmm. I think that's that sums up the differences between books and and film. And, and 40 pages of that 60 pages is how you will never make any money off residuals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, I had a question for you in regard to The Revenant, because it was so, um, the movie did so well, it's a good movie. Um, how did that affect your book sales? It was good for my book sales, I'll say. Uh, <laughs> I, I always joke that before The Revenant, the only uh, people that had read my books were friends of my mother. Um, and she's, she's got a lot of friends. I read it. Well, and you, uh, but, yeah. uh, but I, I unfortunately could, could count or, or knew personally, most of the people who'd read it and, uh, having the movie change that. So it, I was very happy for the movie to be made. There were things I liked about the movie, things I didn't like about the movie, but I was very happy for it to be made. And it was very, a great thing in terms of bringing the book to, a uh, you know, massively bigger audience and it opened the door, I hope now, for people to, to read other stories that I've written. So couldn't be happier about the movie being made. Now, 19 years was quite a bit of a gap, though, Michael. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we understand you've been quite busy, though, in the intervening time. Well, but, uh, I hedge my bets. Are there any other historical kind of incidents or eras that uh, pique your interest enough to write about them? Um, well, I, I'm very, I've, I've written a couple of nonfiction books, uh, one about a, a mine disaster in Butte, Montana in the, uh, in 1917. But aside from that, most of my focus is on, is on the 19th century. And I, I love every aspect of it. I mean, I love the fur trade era, which obviously is what the, the revenue is about. Uh, I, I had, had, uh, always been interested in the, in the Indian wars. And so that really was, was my, you know, focus for for this book, but there's a bunch of other eras that I uh, of the 19th century that I that I love. I just think I love the I love the land, and I just think the history is inherently dramatic, and and has really important lessons for for today. So wow, yeah, I'm gonna have to look up that uh, nonfiction book because that, that whole era in Butte, 
all that stuff is fascinating. You know, the anaconda mine and oh, I see CJ's hat with anaconda on it. So I don't yeah. know what the story is. Mm -hmm. there, but, uh, 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 the, the next Cassie dual book is going to take place in anaconda. I was there two weeks okay. ago and reading yeah. about that, that mine disaster and what all a fascinating labor, part of the state. All the labor stuff too, the wobblies and Frank Little. There's a, and, there's a remarkable history in, in Butte. I mean, it's really, uh, was kind of the, the guts of Montana for a, a big part of, of Montana's history. Dashiell Hammett and Red Harvest is all Butte, Montana, right? Some very surprising things coming out of Butte. Pinkertons, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, gentlemen, this has been a real, a real treat. Uh, thanks so much, Michael and Chuck. Um, just to do my commercial plug here, shameless commercial plug, Michael has kindly signed a batch of these, and I think they're on their way back to the to us now. They we are have them at the end of the week. So, uh, if you'd like to order one of the few remaining signed ones, uh, you know how to get in touch with us: poisonpen.com. And we also have a little stash, signed and dated even copies of Dark Sky. Uh, so there aren't many of these left either. So. Um, I can't manage to do everything at the same time. Usually I'll put a link up in the comments field, but you know how to get in touch with, the, with us, uh, store.poisonpen.com or just give us a ring. We would be happy to sell you one of these gentlemen's books. So thanks everybody for tuning in and thank, thank you both. It's been a great hour.